let's have a look at how we went from this to this in just a week during the Brackies 2023.1 Game Jam and submitted a build one second before the deadline. The theme was an end is a new beginning. We had a team of three, me as the coder and two of my friends doing art, who are actually both game industry professionals. Being a self-taught coder, I was a bit worried they might expect too much of me, as this was my first game jam as a coder, but luckily neither of them can code, so expectations were low. For us, the jam started at 1pm in the afternoon, so we went out for lunch to brainstorm. The theme got us thinking about mortality, decay, funerals and fungus for some reason. My first idea was in a post-apocalyptic world you'd have to collect corpses for fertilizer to grow food and survive. We somehow drifted into discussing having a dangerous scary space and a safe and cozy space. Later that evening on a Discord call someone just said, what if you were a ghost and you had to steal stuff to make your tomb look better? We instantly all thought it was funny and after a day of brainstorming about parasites, death and zombies and other gloomy stuff we just decided to go with that because we thought it was funny. The game was gonna be a cute stealth game where you as a ghost have to get your old stuff back from your house and you can't let the current tenant see or touch you or you poof back to your grave. No game dev on the first day, just a concept and then we went to sleep. We decided to make the game with 3D art because that's what my friends said they were more comfortable with but with a side scrolling view as we felt it gave a cuter and essentially cozier feel to the game as well as most game assets would only have to look good on one side which would lessen the workload of my friends. We set up GitHub and I opened a blank Unity project. I created the Unity Bean, gave him a VR headset so I could see which way he was facing, him or her you can't really tell with ghosts, and I made him transparent so he would look more like a ghost. First things first, I started with player input. Even though in a game jam you're in a hurry, I wanted my code to be as clean as possible, so I made a separate class to handle and get the input, and I used C-sharp events, which other scripts would listen to. This way I could also refactor the code to work with Unity's new input system later, and I would only have to refactor one class, and no other class would have to care where the input was coming from. Spoilers, I didn't end up having the time to refactor the game, so it only works with a keyboard and mouse now. Which is fine, as most people in the jam will play it that way anyway. Next was tackling slope movement, as I know we were going to have several floors in the game, and the player and the NPC, which we called the tenant, were going to have to be able to go up and down stairs. Now, if you've ever made a physics-based character controller in Unity, you know going up and down slopes is an issue. Either gravity causes you to slide down the ramp, and without gravity, you can't go down a slope. I remembered Ketra Games, link in the description, having a simple solution to this, which was to adjust the angle of the movement velocity based on the normal of the surface the character is on. So I made a raycast to detect if the player is on a slope and I used Unity's quaternion.from2 rotation function and I multiplied the velocity with the angle and that worked just fine. Now I could also have gravity so the ghost would fall down in this floaty ghost-like way but still be able to walk up and down slopes directly. I encountered a really weird bug where the rigid body would start spinning uncontrollably for some reason. To this day I still don't know what caused it. It seemed to happen whenever you walked off a slope to the side. Trying to solve this bug was entertaining at most, but in the end I solved it by forcing the angular momentum of the rigid body to zero if there was no player input. Before ending the day I started on giving the ghost a way to pick up what I called quest items and also trigger interactive objects which we would later use to distract the tenant. On day two I spent about seven or eight hours coding and stopped around six o'clock. In the morning I received the first art mockups of what the game and character were going to look like and I was really happy with this, I thought it looked absolutely cute. Our character artist decided the character should be in 2D, so, so he or she would be easy to animate and also could, would stand out from the background. I made a script to force the sprite's parent object to always face the camera forward vector and not the camera position, as this gives a fun stylized look where no matter where the camera is the sprite looks like it sort of doesn't belong in the 3D space. This also meant that I didn't have to worry about the character spinning on its y-axis anymore. I made a class that flips the sprite based on the direction of the player input and this also controls the way the character raycasts to find a suitable place to put down an object if it's holding one. Next I finished the pickup and interaction functionality. The interaction is just an interface on each object called iInteractable 
and a physics overlap capsule that looks for colliders with the interface and then calls the interact function on that object, which I can then code separately to do whatever it needs to do. Nice and easily expandable. Pickup functionality is also a capsule cast that looks for a quest item class on a quest item physics layer and if it finds one it sets it as the current object and disables it in the scene. On place object on the ground it sets the current object as null and re-enables the object and places it in front of the player. So you're actually not holding the object, you're just holding a reference to the object. How the unlocking mechanic works is that each item has a Unity scriptable object attached and the Mausoleum Scene's Quest Item Manager stores a list of all the quest items the player has managed to take to the cube that reloads the scene in the house level. Scriptable objects are a unit feature which allow you to store data like as an asset in the Unity project and not in the scene. So this is an easy way to store data between Unity scenes. All the quest items in the scene are child objects of a quest item enabler class. If a scriptable object is on the list of unlocked items and there is a game object with the same scriptable object reference in the children of the quest item enabler, that object is enabled and if not, then the object is disabled when the scene is loaded. I made a scene loader script which fades in a black image and loads the designated scene by file path and then fades out the black screen after the scene has finished loading. The scene loading trigger is just a cube that checks if the player walks into it. Last thing on day 3, I received the character animation sprite seeds for both our character and the tenant and I implemented them. So far the tenant can only just run in place, no AI yet. In the morning I started coding a way to display dialogue so we could have a simple narrative and communicate that to the player. I set up a dialogue manager which also works with scriptable objects. Each sentence is a scriptable object with a string and a sound file. If there's a sound file present in the scriptable object, the dialogue manager plays the sound file while showing the sentence. That ringing sound is my placeholder for testing the system. Next I worked on pathfinding, for now the tenant just walks randomly between manually placed patrol points in the house. I used Unity's navigation mesh to control the tenant's movement as there was absolutely no way I could code a pathfinding system or implement an, a free A-star library as I have never done anything like that. So I was gonna go with something that I was pretty sure I could get working in a reasonable amount of time. I added a mesh collider to the floors which I specifically asked my friends to keep separate so I wouldn't have to add colliders manually. The stairs were an issue for the navigation mesh which I had predicted so I added invisible slopes on top of the stairs and used them in the navigation mesh. I couldn't exclude the stairs as they were part of the floor mesh and, I, and like I said this caused small issues along the way which I never could completely fix. In hindsight I should have just asked for the stairs separately as it would have been an easy fix for a difficult problem. My friend who was designing the house level asked if I could add a way to go to the third floor using a fireplace, so I added that functionality. It's just an object with the interactable interface on it, and when it's activated it disables the player's movement and visuals and linearly interpolates the player's position to a manually placed target position and then reactivates movement and the player visual. Next I added a way to show tooltips on screen. It works very similarly to the dialogue system, but it just receives a string instead of a scriptable object. There's a tooltip text manager which has a canvas and then a trigger that holds a string to display. The text is enabled or disabled if the player is inside a collider that the tooltip trigger is on. Using this almost exact same code I made a way to hide in an object. Same thing, just deactivates the player visual and sets the detection handler's is hidden boolean to true so the tenant can't see the player. Beginning of day 5, the first layout of the house level was complete. Most of day 5 was spent refining the tenant's vision code. How it works is the tenant checks using the vector3 dot function if the player is in front of him or behind him, based on this facing direction. Then it checks if the player's distance is within its detection radius, and if it is, then it shoots a raycast towards the player, and if it reaches the player, then we consider that the tenant can see the player. The detection script gets the player's detection handler and calls a function that adds to a timer, and if the timer reaches its maximum, the player is detected. Timer also increases if the player is too close to the tenant. I made this so you can't just walk right behind the tenant. The player is also detected if the player's distance to the enemy is shorter than what I call the auto-detect distance. I felt you shouldn't just be able to go through the tenant if you were moving faster than him in the opposite direction. To show the player that you're being seen, I made the player sprite shrink the longer you're detected. Eventually I wanted to make the player sort of like poof away if he's seen by the tenant. 
I had a lot of problems with this as the sprite's parent object's local scale is already being controlled by the sprite flipper class, so I had to scale the sprite based on the facing direction of the character, and this took some trial and error to get right. This was around 5pm and I copied code from an old project to make a quick audio settings menu. I feel for game jams this is more important than people realize. If you're ever making a game jam game, you can make a quick and easy volume slider just by adjusting the audio listener component's volume. This takes like 5 minutes, there's no reason not to have this in a jam game as audio is almost always too loud or too low. And you can make it just like this and it works just fine. I'll even leave the code in the description. I don't ever want to see a game jam game without a volume option ever again. Last thing I did was I added the first distraction item which was the TV. By interacting with the TV it enables an emissive plane in front of the TV, it enables a light in front of the screen and plays a sound effect. Then it tells the enemy to walk up to it and turn it off when it gets close enough. My hopes for a week-long game jam were that it would be a chill experience with no stress. But with less than two and a half full days left, I was starting to feel the pressure of how much polish the game was still missing. Most of the core functionality was there, but there was almost no player feedback, no sound effects, and no narrative context for, for why you were stealing this orangey man stuff. And I'm guessing this is why I forgot to record most of what I did this day. So on day 6 I started to try to make the game feel nice. I added some copyright free music from pixabay.com. I added an idle animation to the tunnel finally, so he doesn't just constantly do aerobics while standing in place. And I gave him some menacing footsteps from a sound effects library. This worked perfectly on the first try. Then I received the first draft of the outside scene for the tomb slash mausoleum and I started setting it up. When I saw the tombstones I wanted to make them readable. I already had a way to display dialogue and a, and a way to make interactable objects so this was a fun way to blow off some of the stress about polishing the game and didn't take too long. Just added some text that I thought was kind of funny. Then I set up the scene with colliders and added a scene transition trigger on the door so you could enter the mausoleum or walk outside the screen to the house scene. Basically now we had all the scenes, menus and core functionality in place. So the next day was gonna be all about polish and I was feeling Pretty good about our team, slightly stressed but still confident we could get the game to a good state. I started by adding some oomph to the fail state and the player death by adding a particle system and a sound effect that plays when you're being detected and when you actually quote unquote die. I experimented with some more silly sound effects, but I decided to go with the serious sounding version as the house is supposed to be like a scary and unpleasant place and the tomb is like this gonna be this like cozy warm place that you want to be in. Then I wanted the pick up action to be more polished so I just moved the object to the player before it was picked up. But since both quest items and the player have a collider this had some unexpected side effects. This was easily fixed by disabling the quest items collider after the player interacts with it. This pick up action caused a fun bug when you pick up an item that has a light source as a child object but I thought it was funny so I didn't fix it. So it's now a feature. I added a particle effect when the player enters the fireplace and I edited a sound effect for it from a library. Added some more missing colliders so you couldn't walk through furniture and I spent the afternoon lighting the interior of the house scene. At least to some extent so I wouldn't have to do it from scratch later when I went to finish it. Even though the quest items were designed to be shaped and colored differently from the tenant's furniture, I felt it was difficult for the player to know what he could get from the house. So I added some emission to the furniture and the sparkly particle systems to make it extra clear that this is for you and the other stuff is not. I think it's now super clear which item can be picked up. There were some slight issues with interactable objects as you could walk into the tooltip trigger but you couldn't sometimes activate the object still. I think I somehow messed up the hierarchy of the trigger and the object and I was too much in a hurry and stressed to figure it out properly. So some bugs are still present in the finished game. My friend finished the outside of the tomb and I got the final scene. It was now facing the right way so I had to redo the colliders and spend some time fixing lighting issues that still remained. I want to say my new favorite thing in Unity is light cookies. These are awesome. If you don't know what a light cookie is, it's a 2D image that acts as a shadow caster for a light source in a scene. You can basically like make the bat signal for example. Their performance cost is almost nothing and you can make really complex shadow behavior in just a minute or so by having Photoshop open on the side. Most problems that I had with lighting scenes I could fix with cookies. Perfect for game jams. 
On day 7 I stayed up late until like 2am making some additional bug fixes and making the beginning of the game and also a way to only show the player the tutorial and the beginning dialogue just once and then disable it if the player had already seen it. I did this also with scriptable objects which I called global booleans and if a bool is checked then the dialogue simply won't fire. Day 8 was submission day and I woke up, made a build and my global booleans didn't work. Some of them were resetting on scene loads. To my knowledge this shouldn't happen and it wasn't happening for every scriptable object. And this was almost completely game breaking. If I couldn't fix this, the player would see the tutorial dialogue every time he entered the tomb or the house. And with just a few hours left, I started googling what could be causing this. Apparently scriptable objects can in some instance be reloaded on scene chains and cause them to lose their value and reset to their default value which you've set in the editor. So I came up with a really hacky way to fix this. I made an object, I marked it as don't destroy on load and I pulled all the scriptable objects that were resetting into that object. That way they were loaded when the game starts and never unloaded. And this luckily fixed the issue perfectly. I felt like a f genius after figuring this out. I quickly added two distraction objects which I had planned on, the grandfather clock and the toilet. This was fairly easy as I had already the framework for creating interactive objects, but I did the same thing where sometimes you can see the button prompt but you can't actually use the item from that distance, so if you're playing the game just go closer. Then I built the game and submitted it, 6 minutes before the deadline. Time to relax. About 30 seconds later I realized that after fixing the issue with the scriptable objects I never actually reset them before I built the game. That meant that no player that was playing the game would ever see the tutorial. This was 4 minutes before the deadline, so I just quickly... Then I clicked back and forth between my upload status and the countdown to see if I could manage to upload a new build before the deadline. And I did! So, lessons learned. I started learning game development about a year ago and ironically mostly with Bracky's tutorials. And this was my first ever game jam as a coder and doing all the code solo was a bit intimidating. But all in all I'm very proud of what I managed to get done in just a week and all the stuff I learned and problems that I managed to solve during the week. A lot of people in the game dev hobby community say that game jams are a good way to improve your skills if you know the basics. And after this experience, I fully agree.